Yeah, the attention, please. Shabbat shalom, everyone. My name is Andrew Boyas Park, and I'll let it serve you ever as a priest starting very soon. Now time to start finding your seat side of service. May I have your attention, please? Shabbat shalom, everyone. My name is Sunday, you should be up, Hawkins, and I'll like to you forever as we starting very soon. It's now a privilege and honor to present to you the sons and daughters of Yeshua Label now into the sanctuary. All I come to feed you priests for prayer. I'd like to introduce for the first speaker today, the great Deacon David. Shalom, everyone. You may be seated. May the peace of Yahweh be with each and every one of you. Now, as you may have learned by now, the theme of the feast is to believe into the one sent and obey. Part of the requirement or the necessity of achieving that is to be humble. And if you'll turn to page 20 in the book of Yahweh, I'd just like to go over a few things before the men start speaking here, or the rest of the men. Uh, Exodus 20 on page... Oh, Exodus 20 on page 61, I mean, I'm sorry. Page 61. So page 61, Exodus 20, verse 20. Moshe said to the people, Do not fear, for Yahweh has come to test and prove you, so that the reverence for Yahweh will be with you, so that you do not commit sin. Again, Moshe said to the people, Do not fear. So, do not be alarmed, do not be surprised, and do not get so excited about it. Just understand that you came here to be tested, and that you are going to be tested. That's, that's why you're here right now. So the tests are going to come. It's, it's not something that uh, uh, you should be shying away from. You should, you should want to take this test and pass this test, and, and hopefully you've been cramming for these final exams. Part of that is, you know, we've been taught, we've been given all that we need to achieve this. And we should have been practicing it. Those that have been here a long time, we should have been practicing it all this time, and we have. You know, we've been practicing. Sometimes we fail. You know, we get back up, right? And we go at it again. We're, we're practicing. But, you know, the more you practice, the better at it you get. And so when the test comes, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it's partially a written test, but it's also a physical test too. So when the test comes, if you've been practicing it, you'll achieve success more and more and more. But yet if we do fail, remember, let's just put a little more effort into it. Notice what we did. Repent. Go to the priest. Put more effort into it. Find out what we need to do to stop doing this thing and to be more successful at it. And that's the deal. Look up at verse 12 for just a minute, if you will, on the same page. Verse 12 says to honor your father and your mother so your days may be long upon the land which Yahweh your father is giving you. If you look over at the side notes under honor, it says it is taken to mean respect, submission, and to take care of. And there's various verses there that you can look at yourself and go through, study that out, and and follow that to see that that's indeed what it means. And look at the next note there. Well, it says honor your father and your mother. So father and mother, it's at G6, the side note. It says that this verse means is to honor all those who are in authority over him, over you. So all of those in authority over you, you are to honor, show honor and respect to. 
and be obedient. Reverencing Yahweh. Go to the priest. Go to the supervisor. Those in authority over you. Those in authority over you were sent by the one sent. And remember, the theme of the feast is to believe into the one sent and obey, being humble. And, and that's the whole key right there. In fact, so much so that the workshop lessons, all this feast, are based upon that. And so to give you a taste of what's available for you today, if you come to the workshops, it's highly suggested that you do. You really need to be here unless your, your assigned um, job is taking you away from that at, at the time. But you can always get the information, whether it's available on disk or whether it's available online. Or, you know, we have some printouts that I'm sure the South Office would have available for you um, to, to look at so you can follow these high points through if you do miss workshops. So to give you a taste of this today... This afternoon, now, these points I'm going to read to you. You aren't converted until you become humble as a child. The path to hell is called pride. That's point number two. Number three, you must be clothed with humility. That's the white garment to enter Yahweh's kingdom. So humble yourself before the priest. And remember, at baptism, y'all think back, at baptism, we took an oath to obey every word of Yahweh that comes from the mouth of the one sent. If the mouth of the one sent, including those that are sent by the one sent, says that the speed limit is five miles an hour, then it's five miles an hour. Just like Moshe said, you know, go and prepare on the day before the Sabbath and get, you know, twice as much as you would normally get. And that was, I mean, I, I couldn't find that anywhere in, in the laws there, but I did find that you are supposed to obey the priest and do what the priest says, so you do what the one cent says. So that became law when it came from Moshe's mouth, just like it does when it comes from the one cent in these last days. Pastor Israel Hawkins, the overseer of the house of Yahweh, if it comes from his mouth, it becomes the law that we need to obey and do. And we took an oath to do that at baptism. Remember that. Now again, at workshops today, we'll be going over these things to help us to achieve this. To continue on, it takes a lot of effort to humble yourself. Yes, it does, as we all have been learning through this uh, period of time. The next point is you've really got to know the Scriptures to be able to discern pretense from true righteousness. And when we pretend to keep the laws, we are nothing more than hypocrites and Pharisees. And wanting to do, listen to this one, this is the last point here that will be covered in the workshops, wanting to do our own thing is arrogant pride. So I know that all of you will want to be here for that to see how we can put, you know, put that effort into it and see how we can all achieve this white robe of humility. To help us out on this, we've got a few speakers lined up. The first one will be Deacon Yeshia Hawkins. And uh, Deacon Yeshia actually became a deacon last uh, Passover. And so his work shows forth. He stays very busy uh, in, in whatever we can find him to do and whatever he can find to do. And he's doing a great job of practicing righteousness. Our next speaker will be uh, Son of Israel Abel, Deacon White Buffalo Hawkins. And Deacon White Buffalo, he's been a deacon for some years now and grew up in the house of Yahweh, which also uh, Deacon Yeshia did too, but grew up in the house of Yahweh and has been practicing the peaceful solution in, in overcoming and uh, trying to achieve this white robe of humility uh, for this whole period of time. And uh, I'm sure he has a very interesting speech for us. The next speaker will de be Deacon Michael Ossoff Hawkins. And now Deacon Michael came from Nebraska. He's been up here before, so some of you have, uh, have heard from him. And he's been in the house of Yahweh for 21 years, practicing and learning and practicing the peaceful solution. When I asked uh, Deacon Michael Ossoff Hawkins what uh, has kept him here this long, he said, 
Well, I looked at my life before the house of Yahweh, and I see the way the world is today, and know with all my heart that I never want to go back to that way of life, and I pray to Father Yahweh to help me stay in this house forever. Our next speaker will be Kahan David uh, Hawkins, and um, he said that what's, what's really kept him here was Yahweh's promises. And, you know, he, he wanted to stay here to learn how to be humble so that Yahweh could put up with him. <laughs> so he's doing a great job of, of that. A very humble man. Uh, been here since 1995. <clears throat> Our next speaker will be the great con Ilya Hawkins. And he's been here for 24 years this feast, actually. And although, when asked what has kept him here and what brought him here, um, he said, although I was taught the Bible from my youth, Pastor captivated me with his teachings, explaining things that I had never even heard of before on such simple and fundamentally basic terms that anybody could understand. I always wanted to know who Yahweh is, and I realized he was the only one who could tell me, that Pastor was the only one who could tell us who Yahweh really is. And I've also realized that the story he's telling will take thousands of years. So get ready. Our, uh, our next speaker for the day will be Kohan David Hawkins. Another Kohan David Hawkins. And Kohan David Hawkins uh, came to the house of Yahweh in 1986. He had been searching the Sabbath, wanting to get to know really what the Sabbath was, you know. And he acquired a copy of the Mark of the Beast. And what really got him and what really brought him here was when he read that the Mark of Yahweh, I think it starts out on about page uh, 10 or 11 in, in the uh, first Mark of the Beast or Mark of the Beast Volume 1. And he said when he found out that the Mark of Yahweh was the keeping of the Sabbath days, all the Sabbath days. You know, he had heard a little bit about the feast, you know. So, he read that and he thought, wow, look at that. And then the mark of the beast being the uh, holidays and, and uh, Sundays that is practiced out in the world. And when he got that knowledge, it was done. He said he came here and he got involved in the work of Yahweh. And the prophecies, the prophecies is what has kept him here in, in knowing that. And so... This was the only place he got that information. And when I asked him, he said, this is the only place where the truth is spoken. By the one cent, the truth is spoken. Where else would I go? So if we can all keep that humble attitude and we can all work at obeying all of those that are sent by the one cent, and if we can all put a lot of effort into putting on this white robe of humility, then we'll all go into the kingdom together. And with that, if you'll all please stand. It's my great and awesome opportunity to present to you, son of Israel Abel, the great deacon, Yeshia Hawkins. Shabbat shalom, everyone. Shalom. You may be seated. May the peace of Yahweh be with each and every one of you. The title of my speech today is, We Believe into the One Sent by Working. I hope you're all rejoicing and having a wonderful time at this great feast. And I'm going to talk a little bit today about how we can believe into the One Sent. Now let's start out in Jacob 2, verse 14. It's on page 954, Jacob 2, verse 14 through 18. It says, What does it profit, my brothers, if a man says he has faith but does not have works? The faith is not able to save him. If a brother or a sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? In the same way, the faith, if it does not have works, is dead being alone. 
Yes, a man may say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. Now go down to verse 26 and it says, For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so the faith without works is dead also. Believing into the one cent is very important. But the works that we do as a result of that belief is what Yahweh is taking notice of. Empty faith cannot save a person, but when our faith is coupled with doing the work of Yahweh, we show Yahweh how serious we really are. In the 17th book of Israel, uh, 17, 17th book of Israel, chapter 17, verses 8 through 9, I'm going to read the I'm going to read verses 8 and 9. It says, This is the work of Yahweh. Yahshua said something like this in Yachanon 6. I hope everyone has their book of Yahweh. Yahshua said the same thing in Yachanon 6, 29. Yahshua answered and said to them, This is the work of Yahweh, that you believe in him whom he has sent. That doesn't just mean an empty faith like the Baptists, Methodists, and Churches of Christ preach. Empty faith is just total stupidity. Now, remember what we just read in uh, Jacob, that faith without works is dead. Now, in verse 9, it says, the scripture, This scripture means to get behind the work, to get in the work. Believe it. Yes, believe into it. Become a part of it. That's Yahweh's work, believing into it. Eating together is part of the work. It's part of coming out of the world and being part of the work that lets us come out of the world and eat together at Yahweh's house. When we believe into the one sent, we, we become part of the work that he is doing. Yahweh said that Yishel, Yahweh said that Yishel Hawkins would build a house in Zechariah 6.12. But this is not just the work of one man but a family of workers led by one man. And that one man is Yisrael Hawkins. This is how the house of Yahweh is built and how Yahweh takes notice of our involvement. There are many jobs in the house of Yahweh, and being part of Yahweh's work is both a privilege and an honor that we should not take lightly. We should always try to do our jobs to the best of our ability no matter what it is, no matter if you like the job or if you don't like it. We should always try to set a great example by being joyful and peaceful and having a positive attitude. The House of Yahweh teaches us not, not just to work, but how to work and find joy in our work. No one wants to be served by a grumpy person. Pastor said in a sermon, that a worker should always be thinking to themselves, how can I do my job better? He went on to say that no employer would ever get rid of a person who has this type of attitude. I've never been fired before, but I certainly wouldn't want to get fired for having a bad attitude. In the eighth book of Israel, part one, chapter, chapter 27, verse 64, it says, those here for the first time, or even you ancient people too, laughing. Remember, stand in your place. I brought this out in sermons. If you're not familiar with them, get them in the house of Yahweh. Get them. The house of Yahweh and the house of Yahweh, it's showing how Yahweh took his people and gave them jobs in the house of Yahweh and said, you know, he said on the Sabbath day, be ready to take your place and whatever you're assigned to do, or wherever you put your hand to do, then do it with all your might. Pastor has told us over the years of many of the jobs that he was doing when he was learning to serve Yahweh. And in each of them he found joy and was thankful um, he was and was thankful to Yahweh for the opportunity that he had to serve. Another important part of the work we all should be another important part of the work we all should be a part of concerns paying our tithes. Yahweh didn't make this law because he needed money. He created, it, he created it to give us an opportunity to become part of his work and show Yahweh where our heart is. 
Let me repeat that. Yahweh is giving us an opportunity to become part of his work through paying our tithes. Yahshua said in Luke 12, verse 34, Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. When we pay our tithes to the house of Yahweh, we are storing up our reward in Yahweh's kingdom. This reward will be imperishable, as Yahshua said. No one will ever be... No one will ever be able to take it away. And when the house of Yahweh is lifted up for all the world to see, we will have our part in it also. Please turn with me to Jeremiah 23. Jeremiah 23, verses 7 through 8. It's on page 591. It says... Therefore, behold, the day comes, says Yahweh, that they will no longer say, as surely as Yahweh lives, who brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But they will say, as surely as Yahweh lives, who brought up and led the seed of the house of Israel out of the, out of the protected place and from all countries where I had driven them, and they will dwell in their own land. When the house of Yahweh is lifted up above all congregations and spoken about as the greatest work, Everyone will try to say that they were a part of it. Like um, Yahshua said in Matthew chapter 7, their works will testify differently. They, they can try to say, oh yeah, we had a part in the work of Yahweh, but their works will testify differently. Please turn with me to Matthew 7. Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. It's on page 733. It says, Not everyone who says to me, Teacher, teacher, will enter into the kingdom of Yahweh, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Teacher, teacher, have we not prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and in your name perform many wonderful, wonderful works? Verse 23 says, But then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who practice iniquity, you who break the laws of Yahweh. But then he will say to them, I never knew you. You I didn't see you working at the cafeteria, at the press room, at the south office, or at the general store. I didn't see you out in the fields planting and harvesting, or in the goat or cow barns milking. These are not the words we will want to hear from Yahshua or Yeshua Hawkins. But if we look at Matthew 25, verse 21, a couple pages over. Matthew 25, verse 21. We will see the words that we are all hoping to hear. It's on page 754. It says, His ruler said to him, Well done, righteous and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things, and I will make you, you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your ruler. Being a part of the house of Yahweh by serving one another, paying our tithes, and learning how to be a righteous teacher is a great blessing. We should never take it for granted, and we should always remember that to believe into the one cent is to become part of the same work that the one cent is doing. And with this, I'd like to turn it over to the next speaker, Deacon White Buffalo. Shalom, everyone. You may be seated. May the peace of be with each and every one of you. Uh, today I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, the Feast of Tabernacles and uh, just a little bit about it. Uh, I've never been a math guy, so uh, if I get anything wrong in any kind of numbers, then please do not hold me accountable. But um, pastors told us that uh, six refers to uh, the number of man. Six is mankind's number. And in, if you turn over to Exodus, um, Yahweh said in Exodus chapter 20, he's, uh, Yahweh said that six days of the week we shall work, and uh, seven, the seventh day uh, would be made holy to Yahweh. 
in Exodus chapter 20 and verses 9 and 10, it says, Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of Yahweh, your heavenly Father. In it you shall do no work, you nor your wife, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your manservant, nor your maidservant, nor your cattle, nor the stranger who dwells within your gates. Six years uh, were also given for mankind to harvest the fields which he had planted, but the seventh year was to be a Sabbath of rest. In Exodus 23, just, just a few pages over, and verses 10 to 11, it says, Six years you shall sow your land and gather its produce, but the seventh year you shall let it rest and lie fallow, so that the poor among your people may get food from it, and all the wild animals may eat what is left. Do the same with your vineyard and your olive grove. Yahweh then ordained his jubilee year uh, when men are to uh, loose their hold on their fellow brother. If you turn over to, or just look over uh, to Exodus chapter 25, and in verses Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 25, and verses uh, 8 through 13. It says, and you shall, you shall count seven Sabbaths of years for yourself, seven times seven years, and the time of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be to you forty-nine years. Then you have the trumpet, then you have the trumpet of the Jubilee year sounded everywhere on the tenth day of the seventh moon on the day of atonement. Sound the trumpet throughout your land. Consecrate the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you, and each of you shall return to his possession, and each of you shall return to his family. That fiftieth year shall be a jubilee to you. In it you shall neither sow nor reap what grows voluntarily, nor gather the grapes from your untended vines. For it is the jubilee. It shall be holy to you. You shall eat its produce from the field. In this year of Jubilee, each of you shall return to his possession. So seven times Sabbath, seven times seven, Sabbath years are numbered, and then the Jubilee year is the fiftieth year. So the Feast of Tabernacles is made up of seven days, but at the end of the Feast of Tabernacles, Yahweh added another Sabbath, which is called the Last Great Day. And uh, the Apostle Shaul tells us that the Feast of Yahweh are a shadow from things to come. And uh, if we turn over to Hebrews 8.5, the Apostle Shaul also tells us that Yahweh's feasts are a pattern in Hebrews 8. Hebrews 8 and verse 5. It says, They serve at a sanctuary that is the pattern and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moshe was admonished by Yahweh when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown to you on the mountain. Now, uh, the word pattern in that scripture, uh, in Hebrews 8, in the Strong's Greek dictionary means uh, a style or resemblance. It's word number 5179. And the Apostle Shaul knew that the plan of Yahweh was revealed in the holy days Yahweh gave to man. Now, when we understand what Yahweh's holy convocations picture during his feast, we come to understand the future events that are soon to take place. In Romans, if you turn over to Romans, Romans chapter 1 and verses 17 through 20, it says, For in this message is the righteousness of Yahweh revealed, originating from the faith and leading, leading to the faith, as it is written, the just will live by the faith. For the justice of Yahweh is revealed from heaven concerning all unholiness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. For that which is known about Yahweh is manifest to them, because Yahweh has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, the invisible things of him 
are clearly seen, his eternal power and holiness being understood by the things that are written, so they are without excuse. Now, uh, the, the scriptures have been twisted to, uh, so people would think that Yahweh is a cruel being because uh, he has allowed mankind under their own ways to suffer for almost 6,000 years. But when we understand the whole plan of Yahweh for man, we understand why Yahweh allowed man to go his own way for this period of time. Now, when we understand Yahweh's entire plan, we also see his righteousness revealed. And Yahweh's message in these last days, taught by the house of Yahweh, is to reveal his righteousness. And Yahweh has not allowed his people to guess about what his righteousness is. If we turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 25, Yahweh tells us what righteousness is. It should be a familiar scripture. Deuteronomy 6 and verse 25 says, And it will be our righteousness if we observe to do all of this law before Yahweh our Father as He has commanded us. In Psalms, Psalm chapter 1, and verses 1 and 2, it talks about the man who uh, keeps Yahweh's laws. It says, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the unrighteous, nor sits in the path of sinners, nor who sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is the law of Yahweh, and in his law he meditates day and night. So Yahweh's plan is to create man to be a perfect being, just as he and Yahshua are. Now the ones who will become perfect are those who do Yahweh's righteousness and who practice the laws of Yahweh. And through the pattern of the Feast of Yahweh, we, we see uh, the plan of Yahweh. And Shaul saw the plan of Yahweh pictured through the Feast of Tabernacles. Yahweh gave mankind six days to labor, and he's also given mankind 6,000 years to go his own way. And mankind is now laboring in his own rebellion against the only way that will bring peace and joy to man. And as Pastor had the dream, Yahweh is in complete control of his creation, and Yahweh could have restrained man and forced him to live in peace. But then man would have said, um, let me go my own way. So due to the infinite knowledge that Yahweh has, he's allowed man to go his own way, and nothing is being restrained from him. Yahweh, our loving Father, has warned mankind that his own way of life, what his own way of life would bring, and he warned mankind of the curses that he would bring upon himself. So, um, near the end of the 6,000 year period, we already know that mankind would annihilate uh, life on this planet. Yahweh is not going to step in until all hope of life is gone. So when mankind has depleted every life-giving source and there is absolutely no hope of survival, only then will Father Yahweh intervene in the affairs of mankind to stop his creation from destruction. But there is a few uh, who will be saved, and that is shown in Matithia for my closing scripture. If you turn to... Matithia chapter 24. And verse 14, it shows that the message of the kingdom will be preached to all the world by the one who bears witness to all nations, and then the end will come. And that's the message that uh, the house of Yahweh is preaching right now. And in verse 29, it tells of the destruction. It says immediately, but after the tribulation of those days will the sun be darkened and the moon will not give her light and the stars will fall from heaven and the, po the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven and then will all the tribes of the earth mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his Malachim with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the earth to the other. Now, um, for more information on the Feast of Yahweh, um, you can refer to the, the free booklet 
uh, what Yahweh's feasts mean to you. But for right now, uh, that's all the time I have. And I'd like to turn it over to uh, the great Deacon Michael Hawkins. Shalom, saints of Yahweh. You may be seated. May the peace of Yahweh be with each and every one of you. And also to our family who's uh, throughout the world, we, we don't forget you. We pray for you constantly and, and look forward to Yahweh bringing you home so you are remembered and you are loved. So with that, we're going to start digging in here. The title of my speech is The Great Cremation, The Great Burning. Let's turn over to Revelation 18. That's found on page 982. 982. We're going to go through a little bit of... Uh, the Last Day's Witness prophetic song, The Great Cremation that he wrote for the song CD, 982. And we're going to be reading Revelation 18 and verse 8. 18, 8. And it says, Therefore her plagues will come in that time period, death and mourning and famine, and she will be utterly burned with fire. Utterly burned with fire. A great cremation, a great burning. For strong is Father Yahweh who judges her, the beast, the great beast. And if you remember, if you look down to verse 10, it says, For in one hour your judgment is come. In one hour. So if we turn over to page 544, 544, and that is Isaiah 24. Isaiah 24, 544. And we're going to be reading verse 6. Well, let's read verse 5 also. The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants of it because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinances, and broken the everlasting covenant. Because of this, turning away from Yahweh, turning away from the teachings of the house of Yahweh, and disregarding the message coming forth from His house, from the witness Israel and the great priesthood, because of this, the curse has devoured the earth, and they who dwell therein are desolate. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are burned. Remember Revelation, utterly burned with fire, and few men, few people left in one hour, the great burning. Before the feast, uh, we receive from Pastor, we receive his song in the sound, in the sound department, in the music department. And of course, we go to work on it. And I'm going to be reading from The Great Cremation. And um, this, is, this is usually what I get from him. And I line it out. I don't know if you can see that. It's, it's all like that. And then I mark it out how it's going to be. And I use everything. It's always written to where nothing is discarded. He writes them. And his songwriting abilities are just amazing because he always writes exactly what we need. And there's never more, and there's never any left over. So, it's, yeah, that's great. So I, I won't flat make a lot of noise. So. Okay, so it says here, um, it says, You brought all the wars to kill my witness, or witnesses. You were trying to kill my family, all of us, so that we would not have an opportunity to be here. Willing to bring a, the great cremation to the heavens, earth, and seas, only to have your evil ways. Okay, so I started looking up some of the numbers to this song, and one thing I found out is that um, the words are very prophetic, and if you listen to the song, it's Yahweh who's saying these things about His witness, His family, my house. So it's Yahweh who's, singing, who's actually wrote this song and inspired Pastor to bring it forth. Okay? So I went into Gematria and started looking up some of the stuff that was in it, and I started to uh, type in uh, the great, and then just cremation, and just singular words, not, not the whole phrase, and I wasn't really getting anything. So I decided to just put the whole phrase in, and what I came up with, what the Gematria showed, was uh, a couple of numbers and the great cremation in the Gematria traced to the Strong's Hebrew is to test, try, and examine mankind. That's what the great cremation means in the Gematria and the Strong's. 
to test, try, and examine mankind. And if you remember, in Revelation 3.10, Revelation 3.10 for your notes, because you have kept the word of my patience, the laws, the teachings, obedient to the one sent and the ones who have been placed over you following instructions, I will also keep you from the hour, the one hour, the great burning, the great cremation, one hour of temptation which will come upon all the world to test those who dwell upon the earth. The great cremation from the numbers in the gematria and strongs means to test, try, and examine mankind. Okay, now there's some words in the song it starts off with. And it starts off with Star Wars, and we see that taking place with the president pushing the Space Force. We see the Sixth Force, the 666 Beastly System, and Nimrod Course. Now we see the course that they're on is a course and a path to destruction. But remember, a course is also a period of teaching or instruction, an academic period of teaching and instruction that leads people in one subject. And that's what the Nimrod course is. It's the teachings of sin that the world is being instructed in that's going to bring them to destruction. It's going to bring complete destruction upon the earth. So I put all three of those words together in the Gematria, Star Wars, Sixth Force, and Nimrod Course, and I put them all three together, and it came up with Strong's Greek word 2634, Star Wars, Sixth Force, Nimrod Course, 2634 in the Greek, and it means to control, subjugate, to exercise dominion over to lord over. And it's true, all those words there in the song point to that which the beastly system is is striving to do right now, to gain complete control of the whole earth, bring them under their dominion, under the Nimrod beastly system, the 666 system, and setting everything up for the depopulation that's going to take place. So I have some stuff here that I wanted to. So I'm going to be reading from the last day's book of Psalms. And this is from the song, And Your House Prayed, which, uh, by the way, uh, our great overseer said this is one of the greatest songs he has heard. So, And it is a wonderful song. And it's in the second chorus, and it reads, And the rains fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and your house prayed. The heavens roared, and the earth swayed. The four corners cried, and we overcame in that time period. From the song, Israel's seed will come to perfection. Israel's seed will come to perfection. They truly know where their blessings come from, from the house of Yahweh, for those who do obey. Very important. And who do we obey? The song says Yahweh. But who is Yahweh to us? Israel Israel Hawkins. The priests and the priestesses. Anybody that's striving to be like Yahweh, we are Yahweh to each other. Remember, it's been brought out this feast, show kindness to each other. Help each other overcome. Don't make it a burden. Care for one another. Really care for one another because it's important, especially now. Reading from the song, Yahweh is our righteousness. Yahweh says it will come to Yahshua, the donkeys, the donkeys and the chosen branch, shouting for joy, laughing in gladness. Like calves released from the stall, we will surely dance. For Yahweh is our righteousness. And who is Yahweh to us? He is Rohakins and the great priest and priest, the priesthood of Yahweh that's leading us in the ways of righteousness. And we are Yahweh to each other. Again, from the great cremation, pastor's new song, 
And if you go to the South Office, you can usually order the lyrics for these songs and read them. They're really prophetic, and the messages in them are just absolutely fantastic. And the second chorus, it says, My people I'll save from your destruction. My house will show the way to peace. My righteousness they will teach forever. Righteousness, you, the beastly system, the 666 Nimrod system, tried to cease with your evil continual wars. But we know down at the bottom in the last final chorus, it says, my house will show the way to kindness. Because remember, Yahshua said, they're going to know us by the love we have for each other and for mankind and wanting peace upon the earth with continual guidance from above. The olive branch sign will bring excitement and understanding to our eyes with no more anger and no more wars. And of course it repeats that, with no more anger and no more wars. So if we'll turn over to Isaiah 30, Isaiah 30, and that's found on page... Isaiah 30, 23. That's found on page 548. 548. Remember, we're going to be protected from this great cremation, the great burning that's going to take place on the face of the earth in Satan's attempt to destroy all of mankind. But what's her ultimate goal? To destroy the house of Yahweh. But she will not succeed, and she knows it. Okay, Isaiah 30. And in verse 29, it reads... You will have a song. You will have a song as in the night when the holy feast is kept and gladness of heart as when goes in a procession with a flute to come into the Mount of Yahweh, into the house of Yahweh, to the mighty one of Israel, or to the mighty one, Yisrael Hawkins, who is our great teacher. And if you look up to verse 32, it says, in every place where the punishing rod or the judgment comes to pass that Yahweh allows, it will be to the music of tambourine and harps. We're going to be feasting and rejoicing while the world is going down. And you can see it truly at this feast as the world, we see it in the news, going down more and more and more, but the house is growing. We see all areas of the work growing and getting bigger and more projects being taken on, more projects being brought forth. We see a great work being done by the Witness Israel and by the supervisors and the workers in bringing forth this work. So again, support each other in this work because the work's going to succeed whether we help or not, but we want to help and we want to be part of this great work so we will forever have a part in this great work. It's important. It's very important to us. So I'm going to be reading once again from Pastor's song. Once again. It says, My people I'll save from your destruction. My house will show the way to peace. My righteousness they will teach forever. Again, righteousness she tried to cease with her evil continual wars, but she is not going to succeed. Remember, we have the protection of Yahweh. We have Yahweh's protection, but only if we obey and stand fast and stand in our place and let nothing take us from the spot Yahweh's given us to work in. We have the greatest blessings ever. Grab hold of Yahweh. Grab hold of your teachers. Grab hold of the, the supervisors and ask them, what can I do to make things better in this work? What can I do to help? This stuff is not just being brought out for no reason. It's to give us an opportunity to have part in the work and have the greatest positions available to us. So again, let go. Let Yahweh. He's in full control. So if you'll all stand... Yahweh bless your feast. At this time, I have the wonderful honor to turn it over to a great priest in Yahweh's house, the great Kohan David Yasef Levi Hawkins.
<laughs> Shabbat Shalom, everybody. You may be seated. May the peace of Yahweh be with each and every one of you. Well, I'd like to continue the message that I've been giving and um, add a few more thoughts about... Everybody remember where we left off? <laughs> um, Isaiah 43... Verse 28, um, we were talking about the two witnesses. Um, and, uh, and in conjunction with other prophecies that Yahweh had given us that we could see and therefore believe. Well, um, let's go to page... 558, Isaiah 43, verse 28. Um, we were covering this last time. So it says, Therefore I will dissolve the Levitical priesthood. And we, we covered the fact that this dissolve also means like disappearing. And it's uh, kind of ironic that um, it was the Levitical priesthood, was it not, that sought to remove Yahweh's name from the minds of the people and how ironic it is that um, uh, they were they disappeared themselves and also um, and will give Jacob to the curse this brings us to Israel and notice what it says about him it says he was given to reproaches. Now one thing that I would like to everybody to have in their minds is that Israel was given to reproaches because he was set on doing everything that Yahweh commanded him to do. That's the reason. He was set on doing everything that Yahweh commanded him to do and he, he, he had no concern about any repercussions of that. And that's a quality that is quite notable here about Israel. Yahweh had a job that he wanted done in these last days, and he posted it in the um, prophetic, um, uh, prophetic classifieds. And we can, um, we can read that in Isaiah 44, let's start in verse 6. It says, this is what Yahweh, the, the King of Israel and Redeemer, Yahweh of hosts says, I am the first and the last, and except for me, there is no source of power. And that's, that's, a, key, that's a key aspect of the teachings of the house of Yahweh. Verse 7, here's the classified ad. And who as I will foretell? Who's going to do that job to foretell? And set it in order for me, which is being done as we speak. Since I appointed the ancient people and the things which are coming and will come. And notice the nature of that. It's not just a one-time deal. It's... Um, things which are coming and will come. Just in case you think it's not coming, okay, there's that little bit there that says, and will come. Let them foretell them. And verse 8, do not fear. Notice the character. Notice the, 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 the thing that's going to be present there. Do not fear, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from that time and have declared you are my witnesses? So therefore, this job here has to do with the witnesses. Okay? In other words, you can't be considered the witness unless you, you do this job. And that's an important thing for us to consider, brethren. Um, let me finish reading. Really. Is there a source of power uh, except me? Truly, there is no, no other rock. I know not one. 
here's, here's the issue here. Um, Pasta did not have a choice in this. Um, well, he had a choice, but as you will see, he didn't want a choice. <laughs> This here had to do with a prophecy that he had to um, uh, declare and, and declare it, not just declare it, but declare it in a manner that was like what Yahweh would do. Let's take a look at what he, how he actually performed this. In the sixth book of Israel, it says here, and this is this, this is dated um, uh, 1 14 06. And it says, May the peace of Yahweh be with each and every one of you. The feast is in April. We didn't have much time. I want you to write down a date. And the boldness of Pastor when he did this. This is the thing that this is the thing that he had to do. I want to make it clear. Pasta, Pasta's job was not to make nuclear war occur. That was not his job. His job was to foretell. Please keep that in mind. His job was to foretell it. His job was not to make a nuclear explosion take place. Okay? It says, I want you to write down a date. It's going to be Hard to buy anything after this date. September 12, 2006. That's the date we're going to have nuclear war. No, I am not a prophet. I'm not claiming to be. I am an Oki who, who Yahweh chose to tell you and warn you about these things. And you, you had better start thinking along the, the, the lines of preparing for this time period. And pastor stuck to that throughout the year. Now you might ask, where did he get that date from? We're not going to have time to actually cover that. Um, and, but you can go back and you can study it. You can make a study of it. But it was clear from um, here a little, there a little in the prophecies, some of the prophecies, some of the scriptures that you might want to go over um, to, to, to see how Pasta came to that date is Daniel, Daniel 12, um, verses 5 to 7. Um, or you could just read all of Daniel 12 there. Daniel 9, 24 to 27. And um, Revelation 9, uh, verse 13 to 15. And you could see from, from these scriptures, this had to be done. Okay? This had to be done. Um, in Daniel 12, verse 5 to 7, let's just read that really quick. It says, Then Daniel looked, and behold, there, two, there stood two others. Those two others are the two witnesses, one on one side of the bank of the river and the other on the other bank, other side of the bank of the river. So they were separated. Okay, there was a separation there, and, and notice the level of detail that Yahweh gave, showing that this, how things would, would transpire. Verse 6, And one said to the man clothed in linen, who on that future day is teaching, how long will it be to the end of the, these wonders? See, that there is a, a question there that had to be answered. It's an appointed time. Then I heard the man clothed in linen, who on that future day is teaching when he held up his right hand and his left hand toward heaven and vowed by him who lives forever that it will be a, for a time, times, and half and a half when Yahweh will have accomplished pouring out his power through his holy people. All these things will be finished. So, he had to teach it. He had to, he had to, um, prophesy according to these things. It, it wasn't something that he, um, just come up with out of his head. It had to be according to what the prophecy said. There was no, um, question about that. 
So, the thing that I want you to see here with this is that just as how, um, if you recall, with Yeshua, I'm going to compare Pastor to Yeshua a little bit here. And if you could turn to Yachanan 19, verses 28 to 30. Yeshua was referred to Yeshua Messiah, and that's because he came to die and um, save the people from their sins, right? So although he, throughout his career, um, uh, his time on earth, had done a lot of things and already qualified, so to speak, as the Savior, there was something still yet to be done for him to do in order to truly clinch that title as Savior, right? He had to actually go through the process of being of suffering, um, uh, beatings, and so forth and so on, and and die, okay? And that, in doing that, he would have clinched that title, so to speak, for everyone, okay? So here, let's just read this, him doing this. After this, Yeshua, verse 28, knowing that all things were now accomplished in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, this uh, said, I thirst. Now a jar of full, uh, now a jar, a jar full of Vinegar, sour wine had been set, set there, so they, they filled a sponge with the vinegar and put hyssop up, up on it and put it to his mouth. And when Yeshua had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. It is finished. And at this point, he recognized that he clinched that title. Pastor is the same way here. He preached this, this, this message, and I just want to point out some things here, that some thoughts that were going through his mind at the time. Um, the sixth book of Israel, um, chapter 20, verse 91, it says, verse 4, So Yana began to enter the city, for, uh, for a day's journey. And he cried out, only 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Now he puts, let's put this in here. So. Now he puts himself on a limb. Th this period of time could not have passed and pastor said nothing. Couldn't be, right? This period of time could not have passed from the time the agreement took place with, um, uh, um, Arafat and, 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 and um, Rabim, he could not just say nothing, okay? He gives a date, right? Do you see that? Only 40 days to Nineveh, uh, and, and Nineveh is going to be destroyed. Yahweh gives us a date too. He gives us September 12, 2006, and he says, go and tell the world this. Well, that's what we're going, we're, we're doing, and then he opened a door where we can. Um, let's look at this other verse here. Um, Sixth book of Israel, chapter, chapter, chapter 11, verse 56. Somebody said we were putting ourselves out on a limb with this next prophecy. I totally disagree with that. Even if Yahweh postpones it, I will still bring this prophecy. Praise Yahweh. I think you'll be put, you'll, uh, you're putting yourself, you're putting yourself out on a limb if you don't believe this. You see how bold he was? Praise Yahweh. That's the way he had to do it, brethren. Th that's the way he had to do it. And he did it. And guess what? He clinched that title for all of us. You, do you understand that? I, I, I don't, I, I'm not sure if you understand what, I, what I'm trying to say. Okay, but he had to do it like the way he did it. There was no other way. Now, September 12th, um, 2006 came. 
and we didn't have a big explosion. And there came the there came the the, the um the reproaches. There came the reproaches that Yahweh prophesied was going to take place. Did you see it? Did you feel it? Whosoever was here? Yes, yes, we, we felt it. Okay, remember, I, I, I didn't bring my definition for um, reproaches, but I had it written down on my notes. So it says disapproval, disappointment, disgrace, disrespect, shame. All of these things was experienced. So you can't say it didn't occur. You see it and you felt it. And Yahweh made sure of that. Now, let's talk about reproaches a little bit. Let's talk about reproaches a little bit. I, I, I notice here that it, this is a copy of um, of uh, the Strong's and you notice reproaches here, there's, there's five scriptures for reproaches. Hopefully I can get through them. Two of them pretty much said the same thing. That's um, Romans 15 verse 5 and Psalm 69 verse, verse 9. It says, For then, for even Yeshua did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell um, upon me. Yahweh um, so in other words, he's talking about Yahweh. No, was Yahweh reproached? How was Yahweh reproached? Turn to Genesis 2, verse 16. Now, you probably won't get there faster than me, but... Um, and it says, And Yahweh commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the garden of the righteousness and evil you must not eat. For if... In the day you eat it, you shall surely die. It, you will surely die. Let me ask you a question. Who was the first recorded to suffer death? The tree of life. The tree of life. Wasn't that a form of, of reproach? You know, think about it. Yahweh suffered that. Okay? Let's take a look at Yeshua suffering reproaches really quick. Matthew 27, verses 30, 39. And those who, who passed by slandered him, shaking their heads and saying, You who destroyed the temple and rebuilt it in three days, save yourself. If you are Yahweh's son, come down from the stake. In the same way, the chief priests also mocked him. And, 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 and with the scribes and the, and the elders, he saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he, the king of Israel, let him come down from the stake and we will believe him. Liars. The man raised the dead. He trusted Yahweh. Let him de de deliver him now. So you see, this is the nature of um, um, reproaches, brethren, that we have to be careful of. Okay? It says reproaches. More is coming. More is coming. So we have to prepare ourselves, brethren, for, for, for this. And, you know, there's something about belief versus um, uh, being offended that I want to get into um, having to do with the reproaches also brethren because the way we internalize reproaches um, is important okay and um, Yeshua as we can see clinched it for us the pastor clinched it for us we are witnesses here we could not get eternal life without somebody coming and doing what pastor did. That's what I'm trying to say. We could not. Okay? So, I would have had more time, but that's what I have. Please stand. And welcome the next great teacher, Kahan Ilya Heiler Hawkins. Praise Yahweh. Shalom, everyone. You may all be seated. May the peace of Yahweh be with each and every one of you.
Today, I really hope, along with the rest of the priests, to kind of, as Pastor said in 2001, to whet the appetite. To get the taste on the tip of the tongue so you desire more and more and more and more of something, but to know not only you desire it, but why you desire it. Now, I'm going to start off by playing a very short clip. It's about two and a half minutes long, and then we're going to discuss the prophecies that are being fulfilled while we're at the feast right now. If we could please go ahead and play the clip. The Day of High Hopes, September 13th, 1993. Israeli and Palestinian leaders who had sent negotiators on a secret, some thought impossible mission to agree on how to live in peace were at the White House celebrating their achievement. The anonymous bureaucrat who was leaning over showing Foreign Minister Shimon Peres where to sign was an Israeli government lawyer, Joel Singer, now an attorney in Washington, D.C. I was so tired of many, many months of sleepless nights, continuous negotiations, and I was so focused on getting the work completed that all the leaders of the world, all the presidents and kings and prime ministers around me disappeared into the background. Making it increasingly difficult to give up territory. But still, the negotiator believes two states side by side are inevitable. We don't have any option of not resolving it. It's either eternal war or a resolution. But I don't look at it necessarily as a marriage. I look at it as a amicable divorce. We must divide the property and build a good, strong fence. And we have no choice but to reach peace. Singer believes a lasting achievement of the Oslo Accord is mutual recognition. Israelis and Palestinians cannot deny the other exists. We are so similar. The Palestinians and the Jews are so similar. We like the same jokes. We like to eat the same food. And uh, I suspect that I suspect that uh, t 2,000 years ago, this was the same people, a man before, let alone by a terrorist. Even as unrest and anger erupt, a quarter of a century later, Joel Singer's when talks can resume and an agreement might be forged. We have the general framework of Oslo still intact. The two people have, have finally recognized one another. It will take time to get to the next step and then to the next. Yahweh, he ended by saying getting to the next step. Now, that interview was just done two weeks ago. The interesting thing was the only channel that aired that was I-24 in Israel. It was done in Washington, D.C. Now, as we're here at the feast, I want to show you something. This is President Donald Trump. He met with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu yesterday, and this is all taking place at the U.N., and I want to read to you what's being said about what's going on. And it says, United Nations, of course, this is from the Associated Press, for the first time since taking office, President Donald Trump endorsed, notice he endorsed, a two-state solution as the best way to resolve a conflict between Israel and, Palest between Israel, Israel and the Palestinians as he met Wednesday at the UN with the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Trump told reporters that he believes that the two states, Israel and one for the Palestinians, work best. Now, this is the same covenant that Daniel talked about. The same prophecies that Pastor gave and talked about. It goes on to say that he has previously been vague on the topic, suggesting that he would support whatever the parties might agree to, including possibly a one-state resolution, which might see the Palestinian territory become part of Israel. Now, this is a quote. I like a two-state solution, Trump said as he posed for, uh, for photographs with Netanyahu. That's what I think works best. That's my feeling. Now, you may have a different feeling. I don't think so, but I think the two-state solution works best. Now, he went on to say, from that point on, that peace requires a two-state 
solution where the state of Palestine is based on the 1967 boundaries with East Jerusalem as its capital. Dividing Jerusalem. Dividing Jerusalem, Israel getting the west side and Palestine getting the east side. Pastors brought all these things before. This is the Arab and international attitude and all final status issues need to be solved according to the international resolutions and the Arab Peace Initiative. Now notice it goes on to say, he said that the embassy move would actually help peace efforts by recognizing the reality that Israel identifies Jerusalem as its capital. But notice this. But he added that Israel would have to make concessions to the Palestinians in any negotiations. Israel got the first chip, and it's a big one, Trump said, by taking off the table the embassy moving to Jerusalem that was always the primary ingredient as to why deals couldn't get done. Now that's off the table. Now that will also mean that Israel will have to do something that is good for the other side. Palestine wants to be recognized as Jerusalem as its capital. Now these things we're seeing are very important. And I want to, I can't stress enough why they're important. This book right here. The age of this book and what was done in determining how old these things were and when Pastor said these things, I want to put this in perspective. If you think about 40 years ago he wrote these things, 42 years ago, if I was in services today and we had a setup in 1976 like he had, I would be on this side of the wall because I'd be three years old. The great Kahans that are sitting in front of me at this table would be in high school, just getting out of high school. A lot of the friends that I have who are priests were not even born yet. The age that this was done in and the time that has been spent in explaining these things, but you have to remember, this is one piece of a puzzle. If the Mark of the Beast Volume 1 was all that was needed, there would not have been a Part 2. There would not have been a Lost Faith of the Apostles. There would not have been the end. There would not have been more books. There would not have been the books of Israel. The Mark of the Beast would have explained it all. But that's one piece of the puzzle to bringing everything together. But it is one of the most important pieces in helping us to believe. Now, we said that Pastor said back in 1976, he wrote that about the seven year agreement where there would be three and a half years, a time period, a middle part amidst, and then the last three and a half years. Well, I want to show you on page 165 of the Mark of the Beast, volume one, this is just one part of it. Pastor says, we know that that time of trouble will last about three and a half years. Daniel shows that time to be the first half of the seven year period. Daniel describes it as one week. One week is seven days. Prophetically, one day stands for one year, explaining that this agreement in Daniel 927, as you see one week circled, he's explaining that this is a seven year agreement, a covenant, a treaty made with someone. Now, going on. This is very important because you see the last three and a half years. When you see the Oslo Accords being discussed and the peace treaty is going in, you're seeing prophecy. They're talking about the last three and a half years. The question is, did it start with the move of the embassy? If it did, we're five months on, into it already. Or are we still waiting for an agreement? That's what we're really looking at right now. But should that really change what we're doing with Yahweh? No, absolutely not. But we want to look at this a little closer. The last three and a half years, Pastor says, when the events of the first three and a half years have been accomplished, then Satan will be cast down. We're going to have our young men bring more sermons about hell bop and where it came into the closest part of the earth at that time. Those of us that were here, we used to look at it from this pad right here before the sanctuary was added on to. We would watch it from the back of the sanctuary with a telescope. And then it got to where you could just see it with the naked eye. You could just look up and see it. Well, we had in the midst of the seven year period, Satan's first act after notice it was he at the time. We know it's she now another piece of the puzzle with unveiling Satan. She is or he is cast down as shown by Daniel, Matthew, John and Revelations is stop the preaching of the two witnesses. Satan stops their preaching by killing them. It's important you understand what it meant to kill them. Notice the seven-year covenant is made. That's what we see with the Oslo Accords, that seven-year covenant. I want to show you really quick so you'll, you'll understand. In the Mark of the Beast book right here, if you can zoom into this real quick for me. 
Notice the work of the two witnesses. It is a work of the two witnesses. Now, pastor says the two witnesses are... Let's see here. Let me get to where I'm supposed to be. Here it is. The two witnesses are... Uh, let's see. The, the last three and a half years of the seven-year period, uh, the earth is completely ruled by Satan. The two witnesses... Uh, without burial. Now that's key, without burial. Now if you turn over very quickly to Isaiah, without burial. If someone dies, what do you do with them? You stick them in the ground, right? That's what the law commands you to do. Are are we to think that we're just going to quit keeping the law? No, absolutely not. But I want you to turn over really quickly, Isaiah 43, that's on page 558, 43 and verse 28. And if you notice, it says, Therefore I will dissolve the Levitical priesthood, and this is what the great Khan was just speaking about, and will give Jacob to the curse and Israel to reproaches. Notice the word reproaches. You see that letter D. Look over to the side note. It says that you will be, you know, to vilify, profane, degrade, or debase by report with abusive language to defame. It was a character assassination. This man's character was totally trashed to the point no one in this world that did not know him wanted to listen to him. Now, you can talk. In 2010, we went to Oklahoma, and we were at the State Character Education Conference. The superintendent of the schools there took our girl missionary team, and she was so impressed with what they told her about the program, she put them by the front door. She said, everybody needs to see what you guys have to say. About an hour later, she had a whole committee blocking the front of that table. No one was allowed to go to it. They were ushering people past the table. I went to her and I said, can you tell me what's wrong? She pulled up on her iPad. She said, well, I've seen him here where Israel Hawkins was arrested. He's being charged with this right here. I said, can I borrow your iPad and show you where those charges were dropped? And he was actually... Uh, you know, all of those things were taken away because they were false charges. Can I borrow your iPad to show you that? Absolutely not. And you've seen the reproach at that time where they rejected the very thing they were praising an hour before that. They rejected it. Wanted nothing to do with it. Well, look over to Isaiah 43, you know, back uh, 43 and look at verse, look at verse 2. Look at verse 2. In verse 1 it says, O Israel, I have formed you. Verse 2, it talks about how he will pass through the waters. Verse 3 is very important. For I am Yahweh your father, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave Egypt for your ransom, Ethiopia, and Sheba for your price. Because you were precious in my sight, you have been honorable, and I have loved you. So I will give men for you and people for your life. Pastor, there was an exchange that took place. There was a price that was paid for this man's life, for him to be saved. Now, in 1997, Pastor went to Israel thinking he would die. He went there thinking he would die and everything would complete. Something did die when he went to Israel that year. 1997, the Oslo Accords died. It went, it stopped. It totally ended at that time. Now, when we say the myths, Pastor wrote this in 1976. The prophecies fall into place. There'll be three and a half years. They'll be amidst, and we'll have three and a half more years. Tell me what the weather will be tomorrow. This man wrote this 40 years ago. Now, could he exactly, could he got it down to the very day? Could it be three years, six months, and a day? Well, you know, you think about the things he's brought out. You see, in September 13th, and I say this for many people who may not be aware, the Declaration Principles of the Oslo Accord was signed September 13th. Now, October 13th... Well, let me get this here. October 13th, you notice that's when it went into action. October 13th is when it went into action. Now, as we moved along, I want you to notice the year here, 1997. Trouble had started. Netanyahu had taken office. Yitzhak Rabin had been murdered. He had been assassinated. April 1st, you had the Arab League meeting. They called on the Arab states to freeze ties with Israel because problems were really getting out of hand. The Prime Minister Netanyahu, he met with Bill Clinton April the 7th. April the 7th. Now, 
It came out in the news, Netanyahu pays a visit. You see the date there? April 13th, 1997? Well, they were trying to decide how to keep this agreement going. And you notice it says the breakdown in the Middle East process. The breakdown in the Middle East process, and it even went on to the Prime Minister, or excuse me, the Prime Palestinian Justice Minister. The Palestinian Justice Minister. This was the comment he made when Palestine officially said, we're done. We're not dealing with you speaking to Netanyahu anymore. Five Zionist Jews are running the policies of the United States in the Middle East. Um, Madeleine Albright, William Cohen, Dennis Ross, Miller, and of course Martin Ended. It is not possible that the American nation, which consists of 250 million people, cannot find anyone other than five Zionist Jews to conduct the peace process with Palestine, and that's when they officially pulled out. Well, why was that important? Because we needed the quartet. The quartet had not yet been established. The quartet would be the negotiating members to this. So I want to just to, I want to skip ahead just very quickly because I want you to see this point right here. October 13, 1993. That's when it was signed. April 13, 1997 is when it stopped. It stopped that day. So it actually went out of play. April 12th, because April 13th it stopped. Can't really count that day. If you look from October 13th in 1993 to first day of the week, April 13th, 1997, not including the day it stopped because it wasn't in effect, it stopped that day. You see what you have here? Three years and six months to the day. Now, keep this in mind. How many people here have a heart? Raise your hand if you have a heart, very quickly. Have you ever seen it? Why do you believe you have one? We've seen what Pastor brought for 40 years. We've seen it with our very eyes and we're seeing it today. How foolish could we be if we'll believe in things we haven't seen, but the things we have seen we cast aside? Please believe into the one cent with everything you have. And at this time, it is an a, a great honor to introduce one of the great Kahans, David Hyerman Hawkins. Shalom, everyone. Shalom. May the peace of our Heavenly Father Yahweh be with each and every one of you. You may be seated. It's an honor and a privilege to address the called out ones of the house of Yahweh. I'd like to speak to you today about uh, a subject that I've had two previous opportunities to talk to you about, the two altars that are shown in Yahweh's plan. And if you look at the, uh, the, first, the first slide here, the title of the sermon, The Altar of Incense, The Golden Altar with Four Horns. So focusing on the, on the altar of incense today, the golden altar. The other one is the altar of sacrifice, the bronze altar. But uh, today, the altar of incense, the gold, golden altar with four horns, both of them had four horns. In fact, all eight of these horns are going to be broken off by the preaching of Yahweh's last day's witness. And that's the second part of the title here. The four horns will be broken off by the work of Yahweh's last witness, Yisrael Hawkins. And in that process, the transfer of the scepter to Yeshua and the house of Yahweh. The, uh, in Uremia chapter 23, now the altar of incense was off the priest. The priests were authorized to offer incense to Yahweh on the, on the altar of incense. So it was the priest, the priesthood, uh, the Levitical priesthood in Moshe's time, ha who had the authority to, to alter incense to Yahweh on the altar of incense. Uh, but in verse, uh, Jeremiah 23, verse 28, the prophet who has a dream, let him tell a dream. He who has my word, the witness, Yeshua Hawkins, in these last days, has the word of Yahweh, the law and the prophets. Let him speak my word, the law and the prophets, faithfully. And he does. To, to his full, full extent, he preaches Yahweh's word faithfully. What is the chaff compared to the wheat? You know, what is the husk that's around the weed kernel? It's blown away in the wind. It's nothing. 
but the wheat, that's valuable, says Yahweh. Is not my word, the law and the prophets, like a fire? Isn't it something that went forth in our hearts and it's going out from Yahweh's house to all the world in these last days? Is not my word, the law and the prophets, like a fire, says Yahweh, and like a hammer breaks rocks or kingdoms or nations uh, to, to pieces? Revelation 8, verse, verse 5, And the Malach, Yisrael Hawkins, took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar, the golden altar of incense, is the altar that's being referred to here, and cast it into the earth. He and his brother began working together in 1962. And for 28 years, they worked together, ministered together, found the name of the house of Yahweh together, defended the house of Yahweh together, established the house of Yahweh together, and after 28 years working together, the witness, Jacob passed away. And that was in the 22nd of the third Roman month, 1991. So, uh, but it's the witness, Yisrael Hawkins, who has continued doing the work of Yahweh by himself for the last 28 years with, with, the, with the help of the family of Yahweh, the congregation of the house of Yahweh. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. This is speaking of the work of the two witnesses. Now let's look at one of the things that uh, Moshe was given by Yahweh, showing the pattern of the heavenly things. In Exodus 37, look at verse 25. It says, he made an altar, an incense altar out of Akasha wood. Now I've uh, added mesquite there, which is a type of Akasha type wood. It was the altar was square, a cubit long, or a cubit wide, and now a Hebrew cubit is about 18 inches, and two cubits high. So it's about a foot and a half square by three feet high, and it had horns were made of one piece with it. So it had four horns. Now the honey mesquite tree from the trees of Texas reference I looked at, the wood is heavy, hard, and dark brown in color with lighter sapwood and is used for fuel, barbecue, fence posts, flooring, furniture, and the altar of incense is a, a type of furniture. It looks like a piece of furniture, but for a very special purpose. And from the mesquite tree, flowers make an excellent honey, and we can enjoy that here at the Great House of Yahweh. The honey uh, is, some of it comes from the mesquite trees here. And the seeds from the mesquite tree are sometimes used as livestock feed and they forage on that if there's nothing else to eat during the droughts. Now this next picture here is shows one stage of construction of the altar of incense here at the house of Yahweh. This is the beautiful, beautiful mesquite wood that the altar of incense was constructed from. Started out with logs, saw cut here, uh, the logs were the, the boards were planed and fashioned by the craftsmen here at the house of Yahweh. And at this point in the construction, pastor didn't want the horns added to, to the altar of incense. So you see no horns at this stage of the construction of the altar of incense. Now, Exodus 37, verse 25 continues, its horns were made of one piece with it. Now, these were not animal horns, they're mesquite wood horns. They're pieces of wood. Pieces of wood. From the 11th book of Yisrael, part 1, chapter 16, pastor said, but Yahweh is predicting, and he lays out a pattern, which he keeps in the heaven, and this is part of that pattern, the altar of incense. We see this in Revelation. Yahshua is standing there with it at this time, guiding the work, working with the last day's witness, Yisrael Hawkins, doing the work that's going to bind him to the altar. Now he's speaking of here, of not the altar of death, he's speaking of the altar of incense. This is a, the service of the priesthood, the altar of incense. And this is a future time. The altar of incense, the golden altar, not the altar of sacrifice, pastor is saying, he's not going to be sacrificed again. He was sacrificed once and for all, our sins, and is our atonement. But there are two altars with four horns. Remember that. Now, I've, I've showed you this slide before, but I'd like to review it again because of the significance of this is the encampment of the children of Israel 
three million people camped in the wilderness of Sinai. And Pastor talked a little bit about the tents. The tents, these white dots on this picture here, represents the tents that they lived in and the preparations they must have made for this journey into the wilderness of Sinai. So in the center of the picture, you have the tent of meeting with the curtain, uh, the courtyard around it. You have, and if my cursor is working here, it is. The uh, right here, this is the altar of sacrifice, a bronze altar. And down at the peaceful scene, there is a an altar built down. The, the, there's a representation of the altar of sacrifice down at the peaceful scene. And you can see that one of the horns was, is broken off to represent this very thing we're talking about. But this altar was for sacrificing the offerings, and that's, that's what its purpose was. It was larger than the altar of incense. Now, inside the tent of the meeting, right about here, in the, in the most holy place, was the altar of incense, so the one we're focusing on here with the sermon today. Now, this is not uh, this uh, cloud. This is a cloud that uh, the scriptures say was present over the uh, tent of meeting when they were encamped. Now, on the, uh, on the right here, you had the first member of the quartet. You had the tribe of Yara with the tribes of Ishikar and Zebulun. His symbol was the lion. You can find that in the book of Revelation, speaking of the lion. On the South, you had the second member of the quartet, the tribe of Reuben with Simeon and Gad, and his symbol was the face of a man, the face of a man. And on the west, you had the tribe of Ephraim, the third member of the quartet, with the tribes of Manasseh and Benjamin. And his symbol was the calf or the ox. And on the north, you had the tribe of Dan, the fourth member of the quartet, with Asher and Naphtali, and his symbol was the flying eagles. And then camped around the tent of meeting and doing the work of the tent of meeting was Moshe, Aaron, and the tribe of Levi. Now, this, uh, this picture uh, downloaded from the internet it shows that the reason I like this picture is because it shows the comparative sizes of the altar, uh, the bronze altar, the altar of sacrifice, versus the, the altar of incense. So the altar here in the middle, that's the altar of sacrifice, the bronze altar. It was a kasha wood overlaid with bronze and had a bronze grating on it, and you can see the lamb being offered here. Think of our great high priest Yeshua bound to the altar of sacrifice once for all. He is our atonement. And a little ramp on the front here so the priest could stand on it. This was about four and a half feet tall. But now in contrast to that, on the left, the altar of incense, you see the incense arising from it. It, it was uh, a foot and a half by foot and a half by three feet high. You see the two poles and the molding around the top. And that's where the priest offered incense in the tent of meeting to Yahweh. Now, in Exodus 30, uh, 27, verse 2, we read, Make a horn at each of the four corners so that the horns of the altar are one piece. And the word horns is Hebrew word 7161, and it means a horn as projecting from, a, from an animal or from an altar, for example, a horn of a mountain, Matterhorn, is a name that comes to mind when I think about this definition. A resemblance of an elephant tooth, a corner of, a, of the altar, a peak of a mountain, figuratively power. Scripturally, these horns signify power, the power of the priesthood, for example, in, in the, uh, and, and the power of the priesthood's rulership over the quartet figuratively power. If you keep that uh, definition in mind, power of rulership, comes from uh, Hebrew word 7160, which, which means to push or gore. And that's what we see a lot in the world today, the pushing and the goring 
of the nations and of the Vatican, the, the Catholic Church, in ruling over the kings of the earth, we see a lot of pushing and goring and suffering and wars and, and heartache among the people and, and soon, to, soon to be followed with uh, utter destruction. So this the next picture here. Here we see the altar of incense with the horns on it. And I took this picture before we cut the horns off. And why did we cut them off? Because pastor said, put the horns there, but cut them off, chop them off, because that's what the house of Yahweh is prophesied to do, to cut off the horns of the altar. So these are mesquite, pieces of mesquite wood, the four horns of the golden altar with the horns. This picture is pretty complete as far as the construction of the altar of incense, with one exception. And we'll see what that is here in just a minute. So from the 11th book of Yisrael, part, part 2, chapter 6, pastor taught us, he said, but the ones who will accept you, now this is talking about a future time, this is talking about Yahweh's kingdom, Yeshua, Yeshua coming, coming, to, coming to authority, us receiving our reward. But pastor writes here, but the ones who will accept you are going to be the mass majority of this universe who are going to do this. And once the quartet sees what we're saying is truth, they're going to lay down their arms too. Yahweh promises this in cutting off the four horns of this blasted altar of death. This system, represented by the altar of sacrifice and at, at present the, the altar of incense ruled by the, the priesthood in Yada, the Vatican, that's what you're going to do. Now this next picture shows the horns chopped off, chopped off the altar, and you can see the break marks, you can see the, the chopping off, the, the, the effect of uh, chopping off these, these four horns. And what, what you see in the middle there is one of the horns that was chopped off that had, has been, or had been overlaid with gold at, this, at the time this, this picture was, was taken. But uh, so, so the horns of this golden altar have been chopped off. And if you look at Exodus 37, this continues regarding the description of, of the golden altar. He overlaid it, the altar of incense, with pure gold. The top and all the sides and the horns were overlaid with pure gold. And he also made a gold molding around it. He made two rings of gold for it below the molding, two on opposite sides to hold the poles used to carry it. He made the poles of acacia wood, again, using the Texas mesquite wood, and overlaid the poles with gold. So this is an example. It's a picture during the construction process here at the House of Yahweh. You see... You see the poles in place. You see the gold rings. You see this side, the right side in your picture, was, has been overlaid with gold leaf. This gold leaf is very, very thin, 24 karat gold sheets. They're three by three inches square. There is a water-based adhesive applied to the mesquite wood. It's let to dry, so it's tacky like scotch tape, tacky, and then the gold leaf is peeled off very carefully and applied to the mesquite wood. And this picture also, you can see the, the horns that have been chopped off and hanging with gold chains, which is what Pastor asked for. He said, Pick them off the floor. We didn't say pick them off the floor, but the prophets say they're going to be chopped off and hit the floor. But he said, hang them with gold chains. This is a picture of the finished golden altar of incense here at the, here at the great house of Yahweh. You see the horns, the horns at the four corners. They've been chopped off. 
You see the uh, the gold leaf, gold leaf applied to the top and the sides, the poles, and and the horns, and uh, and of course uh, the the gold rings, 24 karat gold plated rings on the altar of incense. So continuing with the scriptures here, let's talk more about what the witness is doing as we speak in the work that he's done. Up, up until this particular, uh, this time in history, the things that the house of Yahweh, the two witnesses have already accomplished and what they're doing in breaking down these kingdoms. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44, and in the last days of these kings, Yahweh in heaven will appoint a kingdom of priests. That's what we're all learning and studying and striving to become an overcoming, which will never be destroyed nor will the kingdom be left to another people. No, we're the ones, and those who are waiting for, for their rewards in, in the grave at this time, but have qualified. But it will break to pieces. Notice, it will break to pieces these kingdoms, as symbolized by the breaking off of the horns of the golden altar and the altar of incense, and consume all these kingdoms, and it will stand forever, Yahweh's kingdom. But just as you saw that stone was cut out, of the mountain without hands this is the preaching it's the teaching it's the uh, instructions to the world it's it's the going out of the message of this kingdom by the witness that's doing this it isn't any militaristic type force or power that broke in pieces the iron the bronze the clay the silver and the gold so the great father Yahweh has made known to the king what will come to pass hereafter, in the last days, in fact. Now, in Amasya chapter 3, verse 14, we, we, see, we see the cutting off of the horns of the, of the altars of Bethel, the kingdoms of this world today. In, in that day, I will punish the transgressions of Israel, the quartet, the Vatican, the powers that are in authority at this time. I will also visit, destroy the altars of Bethel, which means the house of the gods, the horns of the altar will be cut off and fall to the ground. They're going to be destroyed. They're going to destroy themselves through their warfare, their foolish warfare. I will tear down the winter house and the summer house. Pastor read these two verses two days ago when he spoke. And the houses of ivory, the, the richness of this world, the richness and the uh, these houses are going to be torn down. Uh, they're, they're going to be, they're going to destroy themselves. The great houses will come to an end, says Yahweh. This is a prophecy, and it will most assuredly come to pass. Now look at the, the depthness of the words of the prophet Amasya here in the inspired words he wrote. The horns will be cut off. And this is what Pastor, I'm convinced, was trying to get into my mind with respect to cutting off the, the horns. If you look at, uh, this is Hebrew 14.38, cut off, a primitive root, root, it means to fell a tree. Now, when they cut down trees uh, in those days, they didn't have a nice cha a steel chainsaw. No, they used an axe. They chopped it off. They chopped down these trees. So to fell a tree, generally to destroy or to cut down anything, and uh, so cut cut down, hew, hew down, hew down, like hewing down, chopping off a piece of wood. And of course, the horns of the altars were made of wood. From the 12th book of Yeshua, part 2, chapter, chapter 14, pastor taught us, he said, let's turn over to Micaiah because Yahweh said nothing would be held back from them. Nothing's being held back from the quartet at this time. Nothing's being held back from the Vatican. This system, if you notice the four horns of the altar that were in those films that the Masons have, it represents the altar of death. The altar of death, not the altar of incense that we represent. You know, we're, we're, we're learning, we're growing, we're overcoming so that we can be part of this future priesthood that will, is represented by the altar of incense. But not, not the altar of incense that we represent, Yeshua and the saints represent, but the altar of death whose horns will be cut off 
In our time period now, in this time period now, brothers and sisters and children, from the 11th book of, book of Yisrael, in the process of the cutting off of these horns, the, the destruction of these kingdoms and them destroying themselves, uh, yeah, Pastor said here, Yeshua standing there with it at this time, guiding the work that's going to bind him to the altar. Not the altar of sacrifice. He's not going to be sacrificed again. But there are two altars with four horns. Remember that. And then he goes on to explain here, we'll start to work on this thing again, but it will be fully explained, and you will see our part that is played right here when the scepter changed hands or... The, the, the prophecies that talk about the scepter changing hands in Genesis 49, verse 10, the scepter. This is a beautiful prophecy. So let's go to Genesis 49 and look at verse 8. I, I know I'm moving a little fast through these scriptures. Uh, hopefully you're able to keep up. Uh, write the scriptures down and you can, you can uh, check them out in the books of Yahweh. Um, uh, at a later time, if you're not a quite able to keep up. But in, Gen Gen in uh, Genesis 49, when the, pro the patriarch, Jacob, called his sons, his 12 sons, and he, w he knew he was getting ready to go to sleep. He had lived a complete life and was, and was satisfied. And, uh, and, and he knew that his, his end, personal end was near. But he called his sons together and blessed them and told them what would befall them, what their generations would produce in the last days. Yada, this is speaking of Yada now. Your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. And pastors explained this many times that, you know, the, the neck of the, or the, the hand of the Catholic Church and the Vatican is, is on the hand of the nations at this time, as we read in Revelation 17. Your father's son, sons will bow down to you. You are a lion's cub, O Yada. You return to the prey, my son, like a lion. And we saw the, uh, the encampment in the wilderness, Yada, the lion, his symbol. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down like the lion's breed. Who's going to mess with him? Who's going to rouse Yada? He was a very strong tribe. Mighty warriors. Mighty, mighty, mighty men of uh, war. The scepter will not depart from Yada. And the, the scepter resides with Yada today. It resides with the Catholic Church. It resides with the Vatican and Yada. Pastors explain the transfer of the priesthood from when Titus destroyed Rome. He destroyed Jerusalem, Jerusalem in 70 A.D., and the transfer of the priesthood and the articles, artifacts from the temple, the house of Yahweh, were taken to Rome. The scepter will not depart from Yada, nor a ruling staff, lawgiver, from between his feet until he, speaking of Yeshua here, until he, Yeshua, comes to whom tribute belongs and the obedience of the nations is his. Now, the scepter here, it's authority to give the laws, it's rulership. And these are pastor's words from one of the books of Israel. The scepter, now controlled by Yada, the Vatican, will be given to Yeshua and the saints in these last days. In these last days, brothers and sisters. We're, we're living in a very exciting time period. And so this... This, uh, in, your, in Eremia chapter 23, we see where this current priesthood in Rome, where, they, where, where they're spoken of in the scriptures. Back in Eremia's time, uh, in verse 23, in, or chapter 23, in verse 1, Yahweh, through Eremia, was inspired to say, or said, Woe to the pastors, the shepherds, who destroy and scatter. That's what they were doing. They weren't teaching the, their their uh, sheep, their people, the laws of Yahweh, not being true to Yahweh, but they were, they were teaching God worship. Woe to you, pastors, shepherds, who destroy and scatter my sh the sheep of my pastor, says Yahweh. Therefore, this is what Yahweh, the Father of Israel, says against the pastors who feed my people 
you have scattered my flock. You haven't gathered them and taught them and, and nurtured them. And dri- you've driven them away and have not visited or attended to them. Behold, I am going to visit, attend to you. And that's where we see the prophecies about this end time, the transfer of the uh, of this priesthood to from these pastors, these unfaithful pastors, to Yeshua. But I am going to visit, attend to you for the evil of your doings, says Yahweh. But I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries where I have driven them. And this great gathering is going on. Uh, we're blessed to be able to sitting in the sanctuary here, attending this great feast. But there are many, many out there listening to the house of Yahweh and desiring to be here and desiring to be here uh, at, at this great feast also. I will gather my remnant of my flock out of all countries where I have driven them and bring them back to their foes, their homes, and they will be fruitful and increase. And verses 4 and 5 of Uremia 23, And I will set up shepherds. That's, that's what we're all the training that we go through in the house of Yahweh. That's the end purpose of it, to be shepherds over these people Yahweh's gathering who will feed them and they will fear no more, nor be dismayed. Neither will they be lacking, lacking the knowledge of Yahweh, lacking the knowledge of his laws and the prophes- knowledge of the prophecies. And, and he'll provide our needs and protect us as uh, he has promised. In verse 5, Behold, the day comes, says Yahweh, that I will raise to David, raise to David a righteous branch. And this is speaking of Yahweh's last witness, Yisrael Hawkins, who's breaking the horns off the goal, off both altars at this time through his teaching and preaching. A righteous branch, Yisrael Hawkins, and a king, Yeshua, who is firstborn among man, the sons of men, uh, guiding this work. Will, and a king, Yeshua, will reign and succeed and will execute judgment and justice in the earth. Now, Again, to show where this priesthood that ruled in, Ye- in Yeshua's time also and was transferred to Rome, if in Matthew 27, uh, verse 1, this is, the, this is a historical account, scriptural account of the day Yeshua became our atonement, the day he died, and in the morning, it says, when morning came, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel. And what did they do? Try to help Yeshua be exonerated of his false charges? No, they took counsel against Yeshua to put him to death. This, this was the priesthood in Rome, I mean in Jerusalem at that time, and the elders of the people, the important, the important men of the tribes. The quartet, in fact. And when they had bound him, Yeshua, they led him away and handed him over to, to Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor. This was a formality. I think this was a formality. The, the Romans the Romans ruled that Judea at that time, and Pontius Pilate, the most important man, Roman uh, official there, they had to get his consent, and so they handed uh, Yeshua over to Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor. Notice, notice where the authority to put him to death came from also. And verse 25, Then all the people answered after, after uh, Pontius Pilate went through some motions to say, Hey, I don't think this guy's guilty. But uh, this is what the people said. Then all the people answered and said, May his, Yeshua's blood, rest upon us and notice, and our children. So this includes the priesthood that, that is in power, as in the horns of the golden altar, in power in Rome today. The children of the chief priests and the elders of the people. Then he, Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, he, rele- he released Barabbas to them, and having scourged Yeshua, he handed him over to Roman soldiers to nail him to the stake to execute uh, our, our high priest, uh, great high priest Yeshua, as, as the prophets said they would, that the quartet would do. Now, in Revelation uh, chapter 8, ver- Revelation chapter 11, verse 8, 
I added this in to the sermon here to show to show where this authority came from to to uh, against Yahshua. In Revelation eight eleven verse eight, this is a King James version. And their dead bodies shall lie in the streets of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also Yahshua was crucified. Okay, so first of all, those words shall lie were never in there. They were just added to, to try to make sense of this. But, but really, what, what was being said here with respect to the two witnesses is uh, listed there on the bottom of the page. Revelation 11, verse 8. And there, the two witnesses, their dead bodies, this is the opposition. Cornelia mentioned it when he said uh, character assassination. This is what... This is how they will kill the two witnesses, through opposition to the work of Yahweh, through character assassinating their characters. That's how they work, damaging, destroying their credibility. So, and, the, and there, the two witnesses, dead bodies, the opposition will come from the streets. Like you have Wall Street, the financial center in New York. This is the streets of Rome, where the Vatican's offices, many, many, many men, the cardinals, for example, in their scarlet robes, uh, opposing the work of Yahweh in these last days. Opposition will come from the streets of the great city, Rome, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. Well, there's been many cases where I've documented cases of, of this type of behavior brought against the Catholic Church, there, you hear about them all the time in the news. And Egypt, in Vatican Square, you have an Egyptian obelisk, which is uh, part of the God worship, the sun worship, that's this practiced by the Roman Catholic Church and the, and the other Christian uh, religions. Which also, so continuing, which, which also are responsible. This city, this city is responsible for, the, for nailing Yeshua to the stake. Here's a picture of Yahweh's last two witnesses in the center. Yahweh's witness uh, who is uh, teaching and guiding the house of Yahweh, uh, Yisrael Abel Hawkins and his brother in the upper right-hand corner, his, his brother Jacob. From the first book of, of Yisrael, chapter 24, in Revelation 9, verse 13, the pastor writes, the sixth Malik sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before Yahweh. Now, when I read this sixth, sixth Malik sounded, I think of the sixth time the seventh Malik sounded, because there's only one Malik explaining these prophecies and teaching the law in these last days. Which is before Yahweh, this golden altar before Yahweh, right here, he is talking about the law. If you do not understand the law, and know what he is talking about, the four horns of the golden altar. There's no way you would understand this right here, Pastor says. I could probably spend an hour explaining the verse right here and why he referred to the four horns of the golden altar from which comes forth Yahweh's power. In the future, when, when the kingdoms are given over to when the scepter is transferred to Yahshua and the saints, this is what pastor is referring to. These four horns on the golden altar represent Yahweh's power in the future and his voice as it did with Moshe. Now, in, in, in Revelation chapter 17, I've condensed some of these verses here. I wanted to start out with this first one, Revelation 1, by saying, I, Yisrael Hawkins, the seventh Malik, will show you the sentence of the great whore, because that's what he's done. Who else in the world preaches or teaches the history and shows the deception coming from the seven hills of Rome? Come, I, Yisrael Hawkins, the seventh Malik, will show you the sentence of the great whore that sits upon many waters with whom the kings of the earth, this is speaking of the quartet, the quartet includes every nation on the earth. You have Russia, the European Union, the, fam the group of nations in Europe. You have the United States, and you also have the United Nations, which includes, what, 120? I know the number's not accurate, but 
but a hundred nations in the United Nations, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. They practiced idolatry, God worship, and the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, the color of the College of Cardinals, for example, red, scarlet color. And upon her head was a name written, Mystery Babylon. And I, I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Yahshua. So, and, and we saw how Rome opposed, the Vatican opposed the two witnesses and, and opposing the witness Yishol, Yishol Hawkins in the house of Yahweh to this very day. And the seventh Malik said to me, I will, I will tell you the mystery of the woman. And has not Pastor Hawkins explained the mystery of this woman, what, it, what they're all about? and of the beast that carries her, which has seven heads and ten horns. The beast, the Vatican, Yada, Yada, that you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. Now, this is, this is showing the, the breaking off of the golden horns right here also, going into perdition, going into destruction. These horns will be cut off and go into destruction. Continuing in the Revelation 17, and here is the mind that has wisdom and understanding, as we're taught here in the house of Yahweh. The seven heads are seven horns, in other words, the seven hills of Rome on which this woman sits or has her offices. On the, the, the Holy See, it's called. The nation called the Holy See. That's their name. And there are seven kings. Five. There are seven kings here, up up until, uh, as this prophecy says. Actually, it talks about eight. Eight kings. Five popes. The, these kings are popes. Five popes have fallen. This this since the Lateran Treaty of 1929, right at the time that the witnesses were born. Jacob in 26, Yisrael in 34. Right in, right between those years. The Lateran Treaty was signed. It was, it was a treaty where the rights of the Catholic Church that were taken away from them, land ownership and things like that, in 1870, they were restored with this Lateran Treaty of 1929. And they, and they, became, and they got na a nation status, recognition as a, as a, a country, a country within the, 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 the country of, of uh, Italy. So, Five popes have fallen since the signing of the Lateran Treaty in 1929, and one is... Now, this prophecy here to me is absolutely incredible. One is, that's speaking of John Paul II, who is, was, pope when the House of Yahweh was established in the early 1980s. Yahweh's screaming out, he's saying, this one is the Pope who's going to be in office when the house of Yahweh is established and the chief of the nations. And so he's number, he's number six, and the other, and the other has not yet come, and when he, this is Pope Benedict, look at the accuracy. When he comes, he must continue a short time. Benedict himself retired from the office. He himself shortened his time in office. He did he, so that's, that's what this shortened time means. But notice, Francis is not left out. He's verse 11 here. And the beast that was and is, the, and the beast that was and is not indeed, Pope Francis, he's the eighth since the Lateran Treaty. And is of the seven, you know, he's a pope. And, but notice, he's going into perdition. He's the one who's going to be in office when the horns of the golden altar are cut off and the scepter transferred to Yeshua and the saints of Yahweh. In, in Revelation 17, here, verse, verse 15, And he said to me, The waters which you saw where the horse sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. And the ten horns, these are the ten kings which the house of Yahweh has brought this out clearly in the last several years. These ten kings, orthodox Christian kings, will eat her flesh in the end and burn her with nuclear fire. Verse 18, And the woman whom you saw 
is that great city, Rome, which reigns over the kings of the earth. I was recently listening to a sermon on the, on the House of Yahweh radio station here, and past, Pastor mentioned something about Daniel chapter 8, verse 23. He said, the king of fierce expression, that speaking of the, of the cutting off of the horns of the altar, he said that in verse 25 here, but let's read 23 first. And in the last days of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their fullness, the king of fierce expression, this is a pope, this is pope, it's a Pope Francis, and indeed, dark sen- an understanding dark sentences, he's skilled in trickery and deception, he's going to stand up. And through his policy, he will also cause craft, which is deceit, fraud, to succeed in his hand, and he will magnify himself in his heart, and by peace will destroy many. We see this peace process that we heard about earlier today, of being going, possibly going into effect very soon now. He will also stand up against the prince of princes. You know, he's the one who's going to oppose Yeshua. But notice, he's going to be broken, broken without hands. He's going to be broken with the the teachings that are coming forth from the house of Yahweh and Yahweh's last days witness, Yisrael Hawkins. In Revelation 10, verse 7, but in the days of the voice, this is how they're going to be, these kingdoms are going to be brought down. But in the days of the voice of the seventh Malik, when he will begin to sound, the great secret of Yahweh would be finished. Now, recently, I was amazed to see this on the internet, but there was a headline. A headline. Now this, you can check this out yourself on this website, nbcnews.com slash think. It's a, it's a video. But the headline, the Catholic Church is broken. It's broken, brothers and sisters. And the subtitle, Can It Be Saved? Well, all of us know the answer to that. No, never. Say, so, And just a paragraph, opening paragraph here. After the grand jury report revealed widespread abuse, the U.S. Catholic Church is facing one of the biggest crises in its history. And this came out on the 8th Roman month, the 23rd day of this year. So the transfer of the scepter from the Vatican to the house of Yahweh in Daniel chapter 7, but the judgment will sit and they will take away his man's government to consume and destroy it completely. Then the kingdoms and governments and greatness of these kingdoms that are falling under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of Yahweh whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all governments will serve and obey him. I I like this uh, Roman, Revel, Romans chapter 11 here. It, uh, it, it seems so fitting with these horns being made out of mesquite wood. Romans uh, 11 verse 16, Now if the first handful of dough offered as the first fruits is holy, so the whole mass, and if the root is holy, so are the branches. You know, we follow after our great high priest Yeshua, a total example of righteousness. And after our, our pastor, a total example of righteousness. So um, now if some of the branches were broken off, through, and you, though a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in, you know, we're here, we're called, we're being grafted in to this kingdom, in among the others, and become a partaker of the root and the richness of the olive tree, you know, the last two witnesses, the olive trees, pouring out the golden oil, In verse 19 and 20, But you might then say branches were broken off that we might be grafted in. This is true. But they were broken off. Why? Because of unbelief. They were broken off because of unbelief. They, they, They didn't see and they didn't believe. They were broken off because of unbelief. You believe even though you don't see. And you stand through the faith. You stand here today through the faith. There's an an exhortation, a little bit of a warning here for all of us here. This last sentence, do not be arrogant, but be reverent and thankful for our calling. In Isaiah chapter 14 here, verse 4, that you take up this proverb, which 
which the, the witness, Yisrael Hawkins, has done for 56 years now, that you take up this proverb, this taunting speech against the king of, I added mystery, Babylon, and Pope Francis and the whole, and the whole system of the priesthood in, y- in Yada and the hills of Rome, and say how the oppressor has ceased, the golden city ceased. That's where where this is heading to. No more golden city. It's going to be it's going to be burned, as the prophet said it would. Yahweh has broken the staff, or you could say the horns, of the wicked and the scepter of these rulers that are in authority right now. It's represented by the quartet and the the priesthood of Yada. He who struck the people, this is what they've done. They've struck the people with wrath, with a continual, incessant stroke. He who ruled the nations in anger, unrelenting persecution, wars and famines and depopulation, is now himself persecuted. This is what's going to occur to them. And no one hinders. The whole earth, now this is the end result, the end result. And we're all going to be singing House of Yahweh songs. They're all, it's going to all, they're all going to go viral. So get the files ready when they start asking for them. The whole earth is at rest. It's at peace. This is the end result of the breaking off of the horns of the altar. And it's quiet, and they break forth into singing House of Yahweh songs. From the 13th book of Yisrael, I wanted to add this. This is, this is a summary of, of the plan of Yahweh from the prophet Jacob to the two witnesses. And pastor says, and I'm just going to read it through, and uh, well, here now in Genesis 49.10, he says the scepter, these are the laws, the authority to give the laws. It's the ruling authority. The word scepter, it symbolizes rulership the rod of justice, but it symbolizes rulership and authority. The same thing Yahweh said when he said, I will make man in my image, Genesis 1.26, and I will give him authority. Well, where is this going to start in Genesis 49? It's going to start with a man who was given a crown in, in Zechariah 6, speaking of our great high priest Yeshua, a man who became high priest, high priest over the house of Yahweh, given a crown, starting with Zebulun, but also with the 12 tribes, those who convert, of the quartet, those who convert, represented by the showbread, 12 loaves of showbread. And notice, in our generation here, the lampstand of seven works, showing seven works to Yahweh to accomplish this thing. It's almost finished, brothers and sisters. And in Revelation 8 here, Revelation 8, Verses 3 and 4, I wanted to add this. And another Malik, Yisrael Hawkins, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar, and he was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of the saints. He doesn't need a golden altar to do it. He's already doing it for it. He's he's done it for for, uh, since the house was established and probably before. But upon the golden altar... Which was, be- which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of you, brothers and sisters, and, and all those who are wanting to be here, the great gathering, with the prayers of the saints ascended up before Yahweh out of the Malik's hand. So we're, we, in, we here in the great house of Yahweh are going to have to see how Pastor u- utilizes a golden altar that's, that's been constructed. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing his wisdom and uh, in, in, in doing that. The, uh, just two more pictures here. This is a picture of one of the horns broken off from the golden altar, hanging with a golden gold chain. And you see the chop, chopped off marks there. You see the gold rings, the poles, uh, the beautiful gold overleafing. And the last uh, slide I have here today the, the top of the golden altar, there's a, there's a piece of uh, glass been added on top to protect the top surface uh, from, from uh, uh, to protect the top surface. But, but you see again the chopping off of the horns of the golden altar. And the words there, these words 
come from great Kohan Yedidia, who wrote a song that before the feast is over with, we're all going to hear. And the last words of this song, these are the last words of this song, and it shows what we're experiencing right now in the great house of Yahweh. The four horns of the golden altar of death, they will be broken off, broken off in the, way, in the end. And they'll be broken off by the teaching, by the work of the house of Yahweh and Yahweh's last day's witness, Yeshua Abel Hawkins. So may Yahweh bless your understanding. If you'd all please stand, we'll turn it over for closing prayer.